Hi, everyone. This is Jason Bjerk of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a returning guest. Uh, we've had him on a number of times, and he's uh, one of our personal favorites because we just learn a lot about the resource industry from him. And that is the founder and CEO of Sandstorm Gold and Sandstorm Metals and Energy, Nolan Watson. So thank you for joining us on another podcast today, Nolan, and uh, Happy New Year. And likewise, it's great to be here. Uh, Nolan, uh, I want to start off by looking at uh, 2014 and your outlook for the economy and the precious metals market. Now, 2013 was horrible for the precious metals market. Uh, first time ever, gold was down after going up for the, over a decade, double digit, which is the best performing asset uh, out there for the past decade. And then look at the economy. The stock market did well nominally. Uh, the S&P 500 and the Dow Jones was up 30%. So I want to get your outlook for the economy and, and precious metals market for 2014. What do you think is going to happen this year? Yeah, I think this year, candidly, is shaping up to be a year of a lot of volatility in both the general economy as well as the gold market. It's sort of a transitionary year uh, in the gold market. and We've seen huge amounts of liquidations of gold out of the ETFs in North America, and the vast majority of that gold has been bought in Asia, Asia and the Middle East. Um, the physical gold buying is incredible coming out of those regions. And I think 2014 is going to be a year where the ETFs continue to liquidate themselves a little bit and Asia and the Middle East continue to buy. But eventually in the gold market, that liquidation has to stop because the amount of liquidation of the ETFs, that's a finite amount. It cannot, by definition, carry on forever. So I think... 2014 will be most likely a transitionary year. I think 2015, 2016, 2017 will be uh, better ahead, and that's my, my full expectation. With respect to the broader economy, that one is a lot tougher. It depends on decisions that are made by central bankers, and I don't control those decisions, but I think uh, more likely than not, you'll see continued printing. The Fed is obviously still printing tremendous amounts of money. They are... Um, tapering that, as everyone is well aware, and what's very, very interesting to see is all of the consequences that that's having around the world as the risk-off trade is, is back in vogue and money is no longer chasing yields and it is being pulled out of riskier countries and countries that are perceived to be risky, and that exodus of capital out of those countries is having severe impacts on the worldwide currency markets, it's having severe impacts on the credit markets, it's having severe impacts, therefore, on trade markets, and it's going to be affecting manufacturing, and, and quite candidly, uh, I think the future has yet to be written. I, I don't know what's going to happen this year, and I don't think any, any people can have good ideas as to what's going to happen, but there's so much volatility and so many moving pieces right now, it's just a very, very uncertain time. And uh, that, that's a great point, Nolan. And, you know, you talked about the Fed printing, but it's not just the Fed that's printing. You've got Japan who's doing even more printing than the Fed. And then you have all these other countries doing dollar pegs that are printing, you know, to soak up all the dollars, which cause, you know, massive inflation in the, de the developing world in China, Brazil, Russia, all the developing countries. They've been just slammed with inflation. And then, you know, you have the Fed, uh, the Fed announced tapering that raised interest rates and that brought the money back the capital back from those other riskier countries back to the United States and stuff like that. So, yeah, the, the, the money is not going to stay idle. The money is just going to keep moving, chasing yield and things like that. And it's just I, I think you nailed it earlier when you just said it's just going to be more volatile. Now, um, in, in terms of the supply and demand for gold, you, you talked about the demand side. So clearly, I think um, I don't think it's disputable, right, that demand, especially like in the developing world for physical gold is growing. But um, let's talk about the supply side, because that's something, you know, you, you're a financier, essentially, of the supply side in the gold market. Um, you know, we touched 1180 on the gold market in uh, 2013. Uh, how many gold miners can actually run their mines profitably? Isn't it under 25% of all primary gold miners can produce at that price? Well, it's interesting, and <clears throat> the numbers are changing because it, there's so much wild fluctuation going on in currencies, and obviously your cost of production to a large part depends on what country your mine is in, and so there are some companies that have been able to reduce their cost of production over the last six months just because the currencies have been dropping precipitously in those countries. 
But for the vast majority of countries, and certainly the mines that are in North America, their cost of production has not been coming down uh, too, too much. It has been coming down a little bit, but not that much. Uh, I would say that right now, you know, there's various measures of what it costs to produce an ounce of gold. There's your cash cost, there's your total cost, there's your all-in sustaining costs, and then there's your total life of mine uh, costs. And so right now, the average mine out there for an all-in sustaining cost perspective that is currently producing is in and around uh, $1,000 an ounce to $1,200 an ounce. So they're not making very much money, and a lot of that money that is being made is being soaked up by the GNA of the companies and, and by just being public entities. So gold mining companies out there are not really making uh, much money off of their mines that are currently operating. What is uh, really scary is the prospect of, or the reality that a lot of those companies have debt. And if you're not making any money, you can't pay off your debt. And so you're seeing some companies treading water and trying to refinance and renegotiate with their banks. Some are going insolvent in the process. Some are able to kick the can down the road. But I think you're going to see more and more mining companies continue to go insolvent if the gold price doesn't go up here in the short term. And that's just on the mines that are currently producing. And if you think of a mine as a finite resource, uh, at today's gold prices, there are very few mines in the entire world that it would actually make sense to build where you could not only make uh, some money on a, on a day-to-day basis, but actually return the capital that's required to go build the mine. There's just, just about nothing out there in the world. And that's there a great point. Finite resources. And then that's a great point I, you just uh, mentioned there, Nolan. And as Jason said, with the East accumulating more gold, uh, China accumulated more gold than the annual gold mine supply in 2013. And yet, with the high demand and a tight supply, the price of gold has not gone up. And that's having a lot of investors out there scratching their head wondering why the price of gold has not gone up to reflect the strong fundamentals. Uh, do you think that's because uh, t- it just takes a while for the gold market to absorb the t- type fundamental and then shoot up, or is it just something else going on? Well, there's there's certainly a few theories as to what's going on. Um, I still remember one, a day last year when I was in New York and I was meeting with um, you know, one of the smartest fund managers in the world, and uh, he raised a very good point, which is that uh, the, the gold price had just dropped something like $50 the day before, and in that same day before, worldwide uh, ETFs hadn't liquidated themselves to the tune of 1% of worldwide ETFs all in one day, and that caused the price to drop dramatically. When you put that much gold on the market in one day, the price is going to go down, but you can't string too many of those days in a row before there's no gold left in the ETFs to sell, so that is a, that is a finite source of sale and that liquidation cannot continue on. And I think if you see the same buying coming from China that you're seeing today, same buying coming from India that you're seeing today, the same central bank buying that you're seeing today, if that continues on and eventually the ETF and other liquidation stops, um, it's supply demand fundamentals, the price will go up. Yeah, I think eventually we're headed back to reality with supply and demand fundamentals. And uh, I don't see China's gold demand dropping that much, and the miners just really cannot produce, there's no incentive, I think you'll agree with this, I don't think there's really any incentive to bring on a lot more gold production because there's really not many mines that can be, besides maybe Metnor and a few of the other deals you've done recently, there's not many uh, junior gold producers out there that can bring on a new mine, you know, below all-in production cost of 1200 or whatever. And, um, you know, we're, we've just basically reached the limits where the miners are just going to say enough or they're going to go bankrupt or they're going to hold the metal back and, uh, I think we've basically hit the line there around 1,200 where the miners are just basically, you know, fed up that, you know, there's no incentive whatsoever to bring more gold online. Well, I agree with that completely. And one thing that a lot of people miss, though, too, is the cost of capital of the mining companies. So in order for you to want to and be able to build a new mine, you have to be able to raise the capital to do that. And there is such a dearth of capital in the mining industry that the cost of the capital that is in the industry has gone through the roof. So it is almost impossible 
to show at today's prices to any prospective investors that you can go out and build a mine and provide them with the return that they are looking for in this market. It just doesn't happen. So not only has the gold price gone down and therefore returns gone down, but the cost of capital and the hurdle rate that you have to achieve to justify putting a new mine into production has gone up at the same time. So it's kind of a double whammy in terms of any potential new mine supply. Now, talking about the miners and the way uh, they behave in the past couple of years when the price of gold has been going up, they've been kind of sloppy with their capital by either, you know, expanding too aggressively, uh, not having enough ca uh, cash on the balance sheet just in case there's a drop in gold. And once the drop in gold happened, then uh, we started to see a lot of the miners uh, tighten up uh, their expenses, either by taking their mine into care care and maintenance or, you know, lay off people, uh, et cetera, or shut down one mine and focus on the mine that's uh, more economically feasible. Uh, do you think these miners out there have learned a lesson or do you think they will go back to their old ways once gold go back up? I know you talked to a lot of uh, mining executives uh, during uh, the course of your... Go ahead. In my life and my experience, I certainly come across people on a daily basis who are thoughtful and they like to learn from their mistakes and move forward and become better and become stronger because of it. And there are some executives in the mining industry who are like that, who will learn from um, mistakes of the past and they will run their companies better and smarter in the future. But, and I'm sure you've run across these types of people in your life too, even outside of the mining industry, there are some people who just do not learn from their mistakes. And unfortunately, some of those people are running mining companies right now. <laughs> so I think... <laughs> Uh, some of the same sins of the past are going to be repeated in the future, unfortunately. Well, yeah, I think that's just the thing with human nature. I mean, it's uh, obviously, you know, if you study hard and you read a lot of books and you study from successful people, as I'm sure you've done, Nolan, and Mo and I have done, that you're not, you're not as likely to make, you know, the same mistakes that uh, others have made or you've learned about, uh, you know, bad mistakes and you, you won't make them yourself. Now, um, l let's turn our attention to Sandstorm Gold, since we've talked about, you know, the general economy and the gold market. Um, Sandstorm Gold, you know, had a challenging year. You, you guys have a very solid balance sheet. You have a good number of streams online. But I was hearing stupid chatter from, you know, very smart people on Wall Street. These are hardcore Keynesian people who hate gold. And, you know, they didn't do the due diligence on your individual streams that you guys did, but they were telling me, trying to con well, trying to convince me that you guys were risking bankruptcy in 2013, trying to save, you know, Colossus Minerals, Metnor was going to go bankrupt, a lot of your streams were going to go bankrupt. So talk about how you structured the downside protection in some of these deals to protect yourself in case things uh, didn't go as planned. Yeah, so I think fundamentally the number one way that you can bolster your, your company and, and stay strong during tough times when commodity prices are coming down is through your balance sheet. If you run a strong balance sheet, you'll be stronger than other companies in the industry. And so at Sandstorm, we have no debt. With Sandstorm Gold, we have $100 million of cash on the balance sheet currently that is unallocated to anything. And we're cash flowing at 30 to $40 million per year, even at today's prices. And in the next three months, we have what we believe to be another $30 million of warrant money coming in the door. So if we didn't make any investments in 2014, we would exit the year with $150, 160000000 million of cash and no debt. Uh, so we're coming into this, uh, and we're in this part of the industry from a very, very strong position. Uh, right now, our production is largely coming from uh, a number of mines that are currently built. They're in commercial production, and they have cash not only cash costs, but all in sustaining costs of production that are at or below $1,000 an ounce. So Luna Gold and Rambler and um, Silvercrest and Brigus Gold and uh, even Metanor has dramatically dropped their cash costs as they've ramped up their mines production. And I think they're close to about $1,000 an ounce all in sustaining costs. And so Colossus was one of the investments that we made that didn't make it. And uh, we structured ourselves, I think, from a a security perspective in a smart way, and we are now taking them through insolvency, and we're going to end up uh, being a shareholder in that company, and we'll liquidate that position because our business is not running mines. It's continuing to grow through streams and royalties. And so we're standing here today with lots of cash flow, lots of cash on the balance sheet, and we're eagerly looking for uh, more investments when 
when we can find mines that make sense to build in this market. Now, going back to what happened to Colossus Mineral, now they had a great mine that had a, given your company exposure to gold and platinum as well, and with high grade deposit. And once uh, they got the ball rolling on the mine, they had a cough overrun, water pump failures, and then that had trouble getting further fin equity financing. And then now they're about to file for bankruptcy, unfortunately. I just want to ask you, were there any lessons learned from the Colossus deal that uh, um, you want to share with us? Or, um, yeah, that's it. Yeah, there, there, there certainly were lessons learned. And one of them is the moment that we realized that they were going to be needing more capital. And we had an internal management meeting and asked ourselves, are we willing to put more of Sandstorm's capital into this to get the mine fully up and running and complete and into commercial production? And we made a decision at that time, uh, which I believe is the right decision, that we want to be uh, very strict with our capital and we never want to chase good money after bad. And so we made the decision that we were not willing to put more capital in it. And at that moment we realized and this is something that is sticking with us uh, for all of our investment decisions going forward, we realized that if we're not willing to put more capital in because we're so convicted of what an amazing asset it was, then we should not have been making the investment in the first place. So every time we are evaluating a new investment going forward, we're saying, are we so convicted that this is such a good asset that if they overrun on their capital or if the management makes mistakes putting this into production, are we willing to step in and make sure it gets there? And uh, that's an important hurdle that we will always have going forward. Now, um, uh, af after a new management team takes over that asset, if a better management team comes in, or would you guys consider doing another stream on that deal with a different management team? Or are you guys just basically done then with uh, Colossus? Well, one thing that we fully understand is that our business is a cost of capital business, and uh, we need to ensure that we are seen as moving the company forward in the right direction and uh, having a good cost of capital means having a clean story. And so I think our investors are probably best served if we don't do that, even if it would be a good investment. Uh, you're going to see us focus investing our capital on new names and new streams and lower risk projects. And not, I'm sorry, go ahead, Jason. Now, um, no, Nolan, we've recently had a... Uh, wondering affecting you, uh, you have a number of streams in, in Mexico. Um, what's your opinion then on this new mining tax that's going down in Mexico? Is this going to affect any um, potential streaming deals after you get that warm money coming in? About uh, Is this going to create some aversion to you wanting to do more deals in Mexico? It certainly does increase the, uh, the hurdle rates that the mining companies themselves have to see, and uh, unfortunately that tax is going to mean that there are some mines that were on the bubble that don't make sense to build anymore. Uh, we've got one stream in Mexico right now, and that asset is already up and running. It's in production. It's making lots of money. And so that's not a concern for us. Uh, when we go forward and we look at future investments, there is one sort of nuance is that that tax captures income from the mining company, but it does not capture income from streaming or royalty or finance companies. So it actually makes us a more attractive form of capital to mining companies in Mexico because uh, we can offer them deals where that tax implicitly does not have to be paid. Oh, that's interesting. Did not know that. So, Norman, before we let you go, we wanted to get your outlook for 2014 for Samstorm Gold and Samstorm Metals and Energy. So, if you don't mind, could you give our listeners uh, your outlook for 2014 for both companies? Yeah, for Sandstorm Metals and Energy, this is sort of a what I would call a consolidation year. Um, 2013, there were a lot of things going on. 2014, we're going to take it slow. We are going to continue to liquidate a couple of our non-core investments, try to bolster cash up on the balance sheet and uh, ride it out. And we've got some cash flow from operations coming in from our Bracemac McLeod royalty that uh, Glencore is currently paying. But uh, we're going to have most of our focus this year, I think, on Sandstorm Gold because the, the big issue there is we've got lots of cash and lots of cash flow from operations, and we have to figure out how to effectively deploy that in a way that's accretive to shareholders. So 2013, we did a lot of work bolstering up 
the business and strengthening it and adding to its cash position. And I think 2014 is going to be a springboard year. And if we make one or two really smart acquisitions and continue to cash flow, I think that uh, 2014 will will be a turning point for Transform. Yeah, and you guys, um, after the April warrant money comes in, you guys are expecting what you said, $30 million in the warrant money. That You guys will have over around 35% of cash uh, on your balance sheet in terms of your market cap. So 35, uh, let me re- let me rephrase that so it makes sense. So um, your total market cap's around, what, 400-something million. So 35% of that will approximately be in cash on your balance sheet. Yeah, it's, it'll be roughly around 30% of our market cap will be backed by cash. It's pretty good. Plus, you guys have the streams online. A uh, good amount of diversified streams, so it sounds like there's a good amount of upside. And, um, you know, I'm really excited. I'm a shareholder. I haven't sold any of my shares. Um, you know, I haven't seen any insider selling from, from your company. Um, so I'm very excited here at your future prospects. Uh, I know it's a real minefield out there. You know, we've seen we've seen some acquisitions recently. You know, we've seen Primero take out Brigas, and we've seen uh, Gold Corp make a hostile takeover for, for for Cisco. So I guess that means the uh, the miners are starting to think the bottom may be in two. Yeah, and I think expectations are coming down to earth in terms of sellers. Uh, you're starting to see people be able to although maybe not so much in the case of Gold Corp and Cisco, generally speaking, you're seeing some companies agree on values, which is what we're seeing in our business, too. You need to stay at a certain level for a while before both buyers and sellers can start agreeing on prices, and so I think you'll see us be able to do a couple of streams because of that. Well, Nolan, I want to thank you for your time, for coming back on to to discuss your outlook on the gold market and economy and on Phantom Gold and Metals and Energy. If people want to find out more about your company and a ticker symbol, uh, where can they go? Well, if they want to find out more about the company, they can go to our website, which is uh, sandstormltd.com. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Noah. Uh, we appreciate your time. All right. Thanks, guys.